Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first seminar of the 2021 Republic of Korea, United States, Rock US Think Tank seminar series. Titled South Korean Public Opinion on the US China Strategic Rivalry and its Implication for the Rock US Alliance. Uh, my name is Alex Chung. I'm the research director of the JPI, Jeju Peace Institute, the host of this seminar, and I'll be the moderator today. And this 2021 Rock US Think Tank, se think tank this seminar series is funded by the Republic of Korea Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Just before we begin our seminar, I need to inform you that I'll be wearing my mask during the seminar because we need to follow the COVID-19 protocol. Well, as you just saw, I'm not, I'm not alone in this room. So we have our staff monitoring everything in case, in case of an emergency, like someone losing connection. Yeah. So please excuse me for wearing a mask. Yeah. But if you are already vaccinated or if you are alone in an isolated place like your office or your apartment, then I think it will be okay for you to show your bare face, your maskless face. Yeah. Okay, moving on. So as the title of the seminar implies, today we'll have a discussion on how South Koreans view the US and China, the relations and competition between the two great powers, and what are the implications the public opinion among South Koreans have on the, have on the South Korea-US alliance. And there are a lot of studies that try to investigate whether public opinion has influence on shaping and constraining the government's foreign policy decisions. But some scholars say that public opinion does affect governments and leaders when they make foreign policy decisions. Like for instance, one of the reasons the US government had to start withdrawing, withdrawing the US troops from Vietnam was because the Vietnam War was so unpopular among the American public. But some people say public opinion does wield influence, but the area is limited to domestic issues. Some people say public opinion doesn't have any effect on foreign policy decisions because people are not interested in foreign affairs. That doesn't seem to be affecting the daily, daily lives and interests eh, directly. Well, people just don't care and are not, are not interested in what seems to be happening in other countries and other sides of the globe. Eh? But on the other hand, some people say it is the el elites and the media controlled by those elites that determines public opinion through their influence or even manipulation. For instance, scholars like Mearsheimer argues that public opinion is volatile and subject to elite manipulation, especially when it comes to national security issues. Like we all witnessed what happened in the US during the George W. Bush administration era after 9-11 and a few, few more years afterwards. So there are numerous studies that try to find whether there's a connection between public opinion and foreign policies. And if there is a connection, which direction the causality works? Uh, like is it the public opinion that shapes government's foreign policy or is it the elites and the government that manipulates public opinion in, in their favor? Yeah. So there is no consensus regarding the conclusion so far. Yeah. And also, most of the widely read literature are written by Americans who conducted their studies with American public as subjects. So it is unclear whether the findings in the literature can be applied in different contexts, such as to South Koreans. And nevertheless, South Korea is a democratic country, so leaders and politicians cannot completely discard public opinion. Being indifferent to public opinion can lead to a costly result to incumbents, whose primary goal is, to, is retaining their seats in office. Thus, leaders and policymakers should pay attention to what the public South Koreans think and want so they can take that into consideration when they make foreign policy decisions. So today I'd like to, as like I introduced earlier, we are going to discuss how South Koreans view the situation surrounding the Korean Peninsula, how they view the state of South Korea-United States alliance, how they view the rise of China and potential impact it can have on South Korea, 
how South Koreans think the country should act amongst the ongoing US-China rivalry and so on. So regarding the topic, we have two distinguished presenters and two distinguished discussants for today's seminar. First speaker is Professor Jung Guyon of Department of Political Science at Gangwon National University. Yeah. She's an expert in American foreign policy and she served and is still is serving in various government committees as an advisor. Uh, thank you, Director Jung. Uh, it's pretty an honor to be here. Uh, I will share uh, my presentations uh, so that we can uh, share the same, same information. So let me just uh, start by uh, sharing the uh, talking points. As you can see from the titles, uh, the title of my presentation today is Public Opinion and U.S.-China Relationship and its Implication for the Rock us Alliances. So I've asked this uh, to uh, discuss about several points, but I narrow down into uh, one question. So is the U.S.-China rivalry is a threat to South Korea's foreign policy? So. I have actually conducted survey research about uh, US ROK alliances and how each uh, kind of voters in the United States and South Korea actually see the alliances and their cohesions and uh, what's the kind of area of cooperations in the future. So I'll share the kind of important findings out of this survey. Uh, from the descriptive analysis from that uh, survey analysis, it says that US and, our, U.S. and South Korea is sharing the threat perceptions uh, when it comes to North Korea and China, but they have different approaches to address them and different issue priorities. So uh, in a nutshell, two countries to work on how to address these different threat perceptions and, and, and priority about uh, which one comes the first to each uh, ally. And another concern out of this uh, survey analysis is that there is a discrepancy between South Korea's foreign policy elites and citizens uh, and their perceptions about uh, uh, the rivalry between the United States and China. And also there is a concern that actually South Korea voters, uh, public opinion is not translated into actual foreign policy. So that's the things that the uh, uh, concern that two administrations should work together. And also there could be a concern for the next uh, governments after election next year. And the second thing that I have to, ask to address during this seminar is this, what's the kind of theoretical uh, pathways in which voters' public opinions are actually translated into foreign policy? And mostly there are a number of literatures in the United States and South Korea, and uh, given that their context of foreign policy, how whether, it, whether the public opinion has been actually matters. And in the United States, uh, well, the existing literature rarely makes an importance about foreign policy uh, and their inf uh, in, and public opinions influence in foreign policy. But uh, the recent literature actually make a more specific context in which public opinions can make its way into foreign policy. The first uh, group of research emphasized the, the relationship between the security threats and the voter turnout. Uh, the higher the security threat and the number of uh, uh, voters who are actually going into the uh, going into a uh, vote uh, is kind of increasing. And the second one is pretty popular and pretty, um, a number of literature actually uh, address this uh, theoretical perspective is a rally effect. Uh, in the United States context, uh, 911 uh, uh, terrorist attack has been raised this issue. And when it comes to South Korea's context, the Pukpung or North Korea's provocations or missile and uh, nuclear test has actually, uh, helpful uh, increasing the approval rating of conservative leaders and conservative party. Um, but uh, uh, it depends on number of a number of uh, determinants actually uh, emphasize the rallying effect, the length of crisis and actually leadership who handled the crisis actually matters that than just the rally effect. And the third one, which is recently more popular in this uh, foreign policy literature is uh, issue ownership, uh, that conservative party has a more uh, credibility in terms of handling security issues. And so if there, whenever there is a security threat, uh, the conservative party or uh, Republican party has more upper hand uh, in terms of uh, their approval rating and popularity. But also it depends on many uh, different, uh, pers uh, different issues and different variable. And number four is related to number two and three uh, altogether. The strong leadership and conservative ideology is more related to 
uh, voters approval rating in term, in, during the elections. So based on this uh, the theoretical perspective, which has not been fully addressed uh, in South Korea's literature, uh, especially South Korea's experience with North Korea and South Korea's experience with uh, China, uh, there have been more um, case studies, but uh, not a public opinion analysis. So we all have more opportunity, I guess, uh, to work on the theoretical perspectives and verify their uh, uh, validity in the future. But I'll share uh, some of the uh, survey research uh, outcomes that I have recently conducted. Um, it's not open yet, so I'll just I just share this uh, several important findings out of the uh, research. It has been conducted last June, uh, right after the U.S. RK summit. Um, so uh, it reflect that kind of positive environment between United States and South Korea. So um, there are several kind of important findings, um, which has more uh, kind of implication for today's discussion. Uh, first one, the threat perceptions of South Korean voters. Uh, they overwhelmingly um, indicate North Korea is a, a major threat to South Korea's national security. But uh, you can see that there are variations uh, depending on the ideological position of each respondent. The so progressive more uh, said, uh, they said uh, less than conservative voters that North Korea is a threat, but conservative overwhelmingly argues that North Korea is a major threat. And this result actually translate into how US ROK alliances actually uh, share the threat perception in the later uh, survey questionnaires. And this number two and number three is pretty interesting uh, in terms of uh, their uh, voters actually perceptions about two great powers. Uh, U.S. thermometer is a favorability kind of survey that uh, and is cross tab with uh, another uh, questionnaire whether U.S. Uh, alliance is necessary for South Korea. You can see that there is a kind of uh, polarizations between uh, ideological group and their response to the United States. Uh, positive uh, opinions about United States is more related to the opinion of alliance is necessary. On the other hand, uh, the negative re negative response is more uh, related to the question, uh, the answers that alliance is not necessary. So there seems to be a polarization, so not significant way, but it seems to be a polarization compared to China uh, cases. The number three, the China thermometers, uh, the favorability about China has the kind of consistent findings that uh, regardless whether you, we need alliances with the United States, they are negative about China. So it is pretty different from the case of uh, US thermometers. And it has a similar kind of result about the Xi Jinping thermometers, the leadership thermometer as well. And also it has a similar uh, kind of uh, responses uh, to the Joe Biden thermometer as well. So uh, South Korean voters in a nutshell uh, we, uh, see differently about U.S. and China, and uh, the thermometer or favorability, their perception is kind of determined by uh, the necessity, uh, whether they feel they it is necessary for South Korea still need the alliances. Another question is this, this might be more pertinent to the question of uh, U.S.-China great rivalry and uh, the position of South Korea. And between U.S. and China, which country should be the priority for South Korea? Of course, um, majority, beyond majority of uh, uh, respondents argues that U.S. is the pro uh, pro priority uh, when it comes to the start operations. And it depends, uh, well, whether it is a progressive or conservative, U.S. has the higher uh, kind of ratings in, in these questions. But number five is the kind of showing the discrepancy between this voters' um, respondents' uh, preference and actually how they see the moon's uh, handling of foreign policy. So number five is this, how do you assess moon administration's conduct of foreign policy? Uh, in, it, it has different pictures uh, uh, depending on whether it is a progressive or a conservative. Progressive argues that uh, the current Moon Administration's uh, foreign policy is pro-US, while uh, the conservative think it is a pro-China. So about the same foreign policy that Moon is actually addressing and conducting, uh, different ideological groups are seeing differently. So this could be an, uh, this could be actually very interesting research questions in the future so that 
we can have more detailed information about why these uh, different groups have different uh, perceptions about the same foreign policy that this current administration is actually conducting. And the first uh, issue that I asked you to uh, discuss uh, throughout this uh, seminar was this, what's the kind of issue between US and South Korea? Well, there are a number of issues and number of uh, things that we have to discuss, but uh, I'll just highlight some of the kind of important findings that I, uh, from the survey research. The first one is of course, the North Korea issue. And it, this was actually very interesting in the sense that uh, depending on where you're at, you have different uh, anticipations about uh, North Korea's uh, denuclearizations in the future. A conservative says it is less likely. We're not going to see any um, North Korea's denuclearizations, but progressive, on the other hand, uh, expect that North Korea will denuclearize. So this one, well, Immediately, this will have an impact on next election, next year elections. That uh, this uh, base, progressive base, uh, their preference about foreign policy will be reflected in the uh, candidates in the progressive party. So it will have a momentum for in that uh, context. But at the same time, this will have an uh, impact on U.S. ROK coordinations about North Korea issue as well. And joining the Quad. Um, uh, as I said, uh, this survey has been conducted right after uh, U.S. ROK uh, summit, so it ha it reflects some kind of more positive environment and positive ambience between two countries. So, um, both progressive and conservatives uh, think that it is uh, pretty uh, positive about joining or participating the Quad cooperations, um, which shows a little bit discrepancy between. Uh, current administration's approach to Quad and actual voter uh, preference. And this one is also very interesting for me uh, that uh, the future of ROK US cohesions, in other words, whether do you think um, South Korea and United States uh, future will be uh, more positive or the cooperation will be more stronger and wider. Um, it depends, uh, well, the result was very interesting in the sense that progressive uh, I see that it will be likely to be stronger, but conservative, uh, conservative base, uh, they think it is less likely. So I think we need more uh, deeper uh, statistical analysis, but uh, the background behind this discrepancy might be the North Korea risk, uh, given that there is a kind of luck in terms of initiating North Korea denuclearization talk and current administration's uh, kind of uh, uh, mishandling about North Korea policy. So that might reflect the conservative uh, uh, voters' uh, consideration, but I, I think we need to look at more data as analysis about these questions. But it has an important uh, implication for future of US ROK coordination in the future. And joint analysis, of course, um, the uh, majority of uh, uh, South Korean populations agree with continue uh, the joint uh, exercise. And accept the Panmunjom Declaration as a starting point of uh, starting a uh, denuclearization talk with North Korea. Uh, it depends on, uh, it also there is a kind of divide between conservative and progressive party. And progressive, they think Panmunjom Declaration should be the starting point. But conservative party says half and half. Uh, it depends on the situation. It does not have to be the Panmunjom Declaration to start the de uh, to start the negotiation talk with North Korea. And number six, uh, this would be a pretty good implication for the future of U.S. ROK alliances, and and this should be the kind of starting point whether two allies are at the same page. And South Korean voters, uh, they think they need cooperation with the United States because progressive think it would be good for global public good. And conservative party, they think it is important because it is good for their national survival vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, its relationship with North Korea. So they have different pictures uh, by their ideological positions about us ROK relationship. And you will, uh, so depending on where you're at, you will have different understanding about us ROK uh, cooperations and their uh, prospect in the future. 
in number seven, of course, I asked the different questions uh, for the same uh, uh, respondents. Why do you think South Korea should not expand the areas cooperations? And Progressive argues that, uh, well, we need to focus on domestic issues, just like the United States. But Conservative Party, uh, they said that uh, they need to focus on North Korea issues, so they do not want to expand their cooperations, for instance, like in the Pacific. So this result is kind of a pretty uh, conflict with current uh, um, conservative uh, parties kind of position about in the Pacific. So I think we need to uh, kind of conduct a follow up survey about this, uh, the conservative risk or conservative uh, kind of foreign policy uh, in the current USRK relationship, that would be a kind of interesting topic to uh, endeavor. So uh, the conclusion is that uh, South Korean voters uh, kind of uh, have more favorable favorable uh, perception about the United States, uh, and they share a uh, kind of threat perception with the United States, but they have just different priority uh, between North Korea and China, and different uh, uh, different ways to address uh, this U.S.-China uh, rivalries uh, in the futures. But uh, another concern for the South Korea is that there is a huge ideological divide uh, between conservative and progressive, which will be a risk not only in terms of kind of foreign policy toward North Korea, but also toward the United States as well. So that kind of gap uh, should be uh, narrowed down in the first place before starting any cooperation between two allies in the future. So I'll stop here. I look forward to uh, more discussion. So let's move on to the second presentation. Uh, our second speaker is Professor Yo Yu Gyeong of Department of International Studies at Gyeonggi University. She's an expert in China, especially China's economic governance and China's trade policies. And so, good morning, Professor Ye, and let's welcome our second presenter. The, the title of our presentation is South Korea's views on U.S.-China strategic competitions and the prospects on Korea-U.S. relations. Yeah. So, Professor Ye, you, you have 20 minutes. Oh. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. Um, I am a professor in Gyeonggi University and my expertise is Chinese political economy and East Asia. So, so let me talk about some how South Korea think about U.S.-China strategic competition and the future prospect of U.S.-South Korea alliance. Uh, I do not conduct some particular survey for this presentation, but uh, I based on a lot of some literature and report, and I talk about the topic. The first thing is the public opinion, uh, as uh, Professor jung explained very well, so maybe my discussion a little bit adds some point about uh, how South Korea think about this uh, strategic competition between US and China. So first question is public opinion matter. Um, the my short answer is is important. It's important, but that does not mean South Korean government is is or should be forced by or led by public opinion. But government and elected official and politician take into account very seriously because it is national national view that reflects a lot of how what Korean people prefer. Uh, this uh, foreign relation in present and the future. So it is very important. So based on that um, assumption, the first thing is, is uh, I compare Moon Jae-in and Trump administration and the Moon Jae-in and Biden administration. What is the, what should be our South Korean position between this strategic competition? And you can see from the, my presentation file, most of them we prefer balanced approach, not like um, clearly opt for a particular country, even though we all know South Korea have more confidence and belief and trust in the United States. So between uh, um, uh, during Moon Jae-in and Trump administration, it, you can see almost the 70% uh, respondent answer uh, we need remain neutral. Uh, only 5% um, supporting China side and only 24% around uh, US side. That's the Moon Jae-in and Trump administration. Things are changing a little bit, 
this is based on Moon Jae-in and Biden administration. So still almost half of the population or respondent answer we should be remain uh, we should remain balanced. 56 and and but the, you can see that we have more increase supporting for US side. Probably people have a more expectation after Biden administration, almost 38% prefer and only 2% uh, support China side. I think this is also affected by some COVID-19, some Chinese um, handling this issue. Uh, and at the same time, we have to consider why then South Korean people support more balanced approach. And people have a more some multi-dimensional kind of threat. Uh, in the past, people have a more strong uh, impact about uh, security issue, traditional security issue, for example, some inter-Korea relations around some neighboring power competition. But uh, we have a more some kind of issue, um, for example, the future trade and technology conflict around this neighboring great power. So you can see the 54% think about this issue should be considered. And I think this is a very interesting point. We have some kind of shifting, some kind of interest. So based on 2019 uh, some uh, survey, what is the biggest threat to South Korea? And you can see, as I, as I, as I just explained, the trade and technology conflict. I think this is affected by U.S.-China trade conflict during then, and then uh, some unstable inter-Korean relation and military competition, all kind of these things. Then how South Korean people think about the future prospect U.S.-China conflict? And most of them believe 39% uh, around and can be, it can be better gradually gradually, but a uh, similar percentage of people respond, uh, it will remain similar, main status of call. So that, so from this finding, we can think we have, we do not have strong expectation, uh, this US-China competition, strategic competition will change dramatically. We do not really expect, but, but things get better gradually. I think that's the kind of impact of Biden administration. And how about how South Korea think about US and South Korea future alliance? Um, 77, uh, no, 47% uh, we expect will get better, but also around 40% people and believe will not change that much. Uh, so South Korea show some kind of expectation for the improved some US uh, South Korea relation after Biden, Biden administration beginning. Compared with a negative outlook, only 8% around, but still similar percentage show some cautious opinion that expect little change also very high. And I think this is also notable some kind of point. And what is also interesting is that South Koreans have some substantial expectation for United States to secure South Korea from China threat. And you can see from the, this year, 6%. I think why Korean people have some strong expectation, have a more positive some outlook for US-South Korea alliance because we have some kind of internal insecurity. Uh, is there some China threat is coming and maybe there is some kind of support from United States as a line. And I think that's a very important point. Uh, this is kind of view about US-South Korea alliance. It will help some kind of South Korea security from China threat. This survey conducted in 2019, a little bit old, but I don't think it's uh, changed a lot and slightly likely and and very rightly, so we have some kind of expectation. So I think this is important element why South Koreans support uh, US-South Korea alliance and things. So another point uh, I want to emphasize is, this is very interesting things. 
Korean, we have some kind of dual perception about China. So what does it mean by here dual perception is we have some kind of idea China is very important strategically, economically, also for North Korea issue. But at the same time, it's uh, historically, we have some kind of history. So, so we have this kind of double perception about China. So Korean generally agree 80%. China influence about this Korean economy, you can see from the South crisis, and it's a strategic importance in dealing with this peace process in Korean peninsula, including North Korea and nuclear threat. So however, as I said, South Korean are simultaneously very concerned and suspicious about Chinese increasing influence of North Korea and believing that these kind of improvement between North Korea and China relation um, have some negative impact on denuclearization of North Korea. I don't know why, but uh, there are some kind of suspicion. Maybe China prefers some kind of balance of power, status quo in Korean Peninsula somehow. So the number of South Korean, uh, a lot of people view the rise in China as a threat. It just read to Korean economy and security interest. And this, this kind of perception get intensified, particularly after a sad crisis. So this figure show Chinese influence on the process of denuclearization, as I said, um, China important. It's, it's 30, uh, 36 and slightly big, so together, as I said, almost 80% we perceive China very important for Korean Peninsula peace process. And also, as I explained, impact of this improved North Korea and China relation, positive or negative, negative higher, 36 point something. So this is why uh, we have some kind of suspicion. So, the survey asks, what affect your negative perspective about China? And as I explained, it's that issue. And that was some dramatic change um, about Chinese, some kind of support. And then the after sad is the kind of lack of some respect towards South Korea. Uh, you have great power. China believe you have great power in South Korea, a little bit small. So we have some kind of influence over politics and economy and diplomacy. And Korean people have this kind of perception. And at the same time, another point, what affects a negative perspective is some strong Chinese nationalism. And for example, when we have some South crisis, Chinese government explain and official academic explain we do not ban or official some kind of restriction about Korean product or Korean things, but people, Chinese people voluntarily boycott Korean product and Korean things. So, so this is kind of Chinese people's opinion and their decision and attitude. And why these kind of things happen, we believe there are some kind of very strong uh, Chinese nationalism a kind of element. So based on these kind of uh, my finding, then what is going to be future US and South Korea relation and alliance? So I would like to emphasize two things. Uh, first one, is people think about a lot of these past, future uh, 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 pathways. So the the media and public opinion is divided and South Korea should join and should not join or we, we remain ambiguous. But to have a more positive, some kind of outcome we have. So I think uh, we should not have some kind of, uh, some kind of pressure. So Korean people react negatively when we feel we have some kind of um, kind of some pressure from other foreign countries so that uh, gradually, as I, 
as I understand, Quad is not at this moment some kind of security, some kind of alliance or coalition. I think this is just more multi-dimension, multi-dimensional, some kind of uh, coordination among partner and countries. So I think it's important to gradually public opinion move on what is the some positive side to joining Quad or if we do not join and how United States treat South Korea fairly and uh, with sustained some support. And I think this is important to point future prospect for Quad, uh, the issue of Quad. And another important point is at this moment, we have in, uh, a lot of discussion about semiconductor restriction and Korean business and government are very concerned about this pathway in the future. And I think we are divided. Um, Korean government remains silent what to do about this, how to join the semiconductor restriction to China or not. But business side, particularly big uh, corporation in South Korea is very concerned about future market. If South Korea officially join this kind of United States red semiconductor restriction to China. So, um, so similarly, I think uh, we need a more cautious approach, particularly about this semiconductor issue and future technology competition because that directly affect Korean national economy and business opportunity in China. So, so but in general, I think uh, US-South Korea alliance and relation in the future, very, very positive. And I, we have a very positive outlook. So uh, based on these kind of mutual trust and belief, we can gradually move on and, and build on some kind of trust and confidence between these our two important alliance. So let me stop here my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Yura. Yeah. Um, let's move on to discussions. So, so senior fellow Scott Snyder, could you comment on Professor Jung's presentation? Yeah, you have about 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation very much. And I appreciate Dr. Chung's laying out the uh, uh, issues at the beginning and then uh, the uh, other Dr. Chung's presentation, which I very much enjoyed uh, reading through. Um, I've seen Dr. Chung Huyan quite a bit on Zoom over the course of the past year, uh, looking forward to when we can actually meet. Um, I um, uh, enjoyed uh, the paper. It raised uh, some questions uh, in my mind uh, that I think will be useful for us to further uh, explore. Uh, and, uh, but, but generally speaking, I think that uh, at least from a U.S. perspective, a lot of the results were uh, both familiar and encouraging. Uh, the first thing I want to comment on is uh, Dr. Chung in her initial framing of the question, this is not yet about the survey, but she, she actually uh, uh, framed the question around the research in a very interesting way. Is U.S.-China rivalry a threat to South Korea's foreign policy? Uh, and I actually haven't uh, heard uh, the issue of Sino-U.S. rivalry yet framed uh, in the context of a threat, I, I know it's been a preoccupation for South Korean uh, analysts. Uh, but what is really interesting to me about the way that uh, question is framed uh, is that I think that the rivalry is a threat to South Korean foreign policy, primarily because uh, intensification of the rivalry forces South Korea to choose uh, and I think that we've heard in both presentations that South Korea's default approach is a kind of choice avoidance approach. Uh, but what's really interesting to me is, you know, also there's been the reference about uh, great power politics uh, and how that has historically been the independent variable that implies tragedy for smaller powers who are unable to assert control over their strategic environment. Uh, but what that made me realize is that actually the measure of middle powers uh, is whether or not it can bend the arc away from conflict 
or whether or not middle powers can navigate conflict while uh, maintaining an independent or autonomous direction. Uh, and maybe that's the measure of success for South Korea in the context of rising uh, U.S.-China rivalry. Uh, I also appreciated uh, the uh, presentation of the theoretical um, discussions about uh, public opinion. Uh, I'm not really a theorist. Uh, and so, um, you know, from, from my perspective, public opinion matters in democracy because leaders have to win support from the public. Uh, presumably based on winning uh, uh, public support for uh, their preferred posture and preferences. Uh, and also public views can create constraints that limit the latitude of the leader to pursue preferred courses of action outside the majority's preferred choice set. And so that's kind of the lens through which I looked at uh, Dr. Chung's uh, data. Um, the, the other interesting question I think related to uh, public opinion in democracies is the question of the extent to which good leadership can shape public opinion uh, by winning over support uh, for the leader's preferred course of action. Uh, and that's obviously a mark of successful political leadership. Uh, but let me just uh, talk a little bit about the data uh, and there are actually some questions that came up for me um, during the presentation, in addition to uh, what I saw in terms of going through the questions that uh, Professor Chung featured. Um, but let me um, um, focus on what I had originally um, uh, kind of written down in response. Uh, the first is uh, that uh, you know, Professor Chung's uh, presentation of the threat perceptions uh, in the region um, really underscores for me that there is a lot of political polarization between progressives and conservatives uh, on North Korea and Japan. Uh, and it seems to me like less uh, related to uh, perceptions of the U.S., uh, and also less polarization in terms of perceptions of China. Um, uh, but at various points, uh, I think Dr. Chung later on suggested that the U.S. could become a point of polarization. And so I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Uh, I also discovered uh, in the course of Dr. Chung's presentation that I didn't fully understand uh, the alliance and no alliance categories uh, in the presentation of uh, the data. Uh, and so that might have uh, limited my ability to fully interpret uh, that. But what's really striking in that data for me uh, is the way in which favorability towards the U.S. and unfavorably toward uh, China uh, track with each other in South Korea. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that I think is very striking, you know, when we step back and look at that data longitudinally is uh, the extent to which uh, the economic retaliation for that has proven to be a durable turning point uh, in South Korean views of China. Um, you know, I think that a lot of these questions, uh, you know, a major takeaway is related to uh, the progressive conservative divide in South Korea and its uh, influence on foreign policy. Uh, some of these questions uh, about uh, the um, alliance and in particular the Moon administration's conduct of foreign policy, I think served almost to be more of a Rorschach test for the um, uh, views of the respondents uh, more than necessarily shedding light on what Moon's policy actually is. Uh, and so that's especially striking, uh, I think, uh, in the context of the U.S. and China. I would note the progressive conservative divide uh, in terms of perceptions of Moon as pro-China uh, is really dramatic. 13% progressive versus 50% conservative. Uh, and it makes me think uh, that this issue 
of perceptions of policy toward China uh, is um, really emerging as very ripe for exploitation as a focus of political contestation in the presidential election coming up, uh, simply because uh, that gap is so striking. Um, the other thing that I think was really uh, striking is um, uh, actually the degree of public support uh, for joining the Quad, regardless of ideology. Uh, and for me, it explains the Moon administration's positioning um, on the joint statement when he came to the White House uh, last May, uh, because essentially the Moon, you know, the, during the visit, Moon aligned in the joint statement and in the fact sheet with, with the United States on every issue except a public declaration that it would join the Quad, uh, you know, and also, um, uh, you know, very deftly avoided actually criticizing uh, China publicly, even though it was very, you know, clear what the focus of uh, those statements uh, had been. Um, and then I think um, the other issue uh, that I really want to hear Professor Chung talk more about is um, the issue of conservative doubt uh, regarding alliance cohesion. Um, and I'm wondering if that's affected by the uh, kind of Rorschach test effect, the fact that it's Moon uh, engaging in um, uh, direct interaction with the United States at this point. Um, and then I just want to wrap up here. Um, you know, the other thing that I think is really striking uh, about this issue of conservative views uh, that is different from my expectation is that actually the standard bearer over the course of the past decade for global Korea was really a conservative, uh, Im Young Bak, and yet some of this data suggests that uh, progressives, even though they have an image of being very North Korea centric, uh, actually have a greater appreciation for uh, the, um, the reputational benefits uh, that South Korea gains from participating uh, in uh, provision of global public uh, goods. Uh, and so just to conclude, I'm really interested in hearing Professor Chung talk a little bit more about uh, the risks of uh, polarization, uh, domestic polarization in South Korea to uh, the US-Korea alliance, because I don't really see very much of that uh, at this point. Uh, and also uh, I'm interested in whether or not um, she thinks that the alliance may face an unappreciated threat from conservatives uh, who appear to be using alliance support more as a club to beat progressives uh, than actually uh, sometimes seeming to believe uh, in the value of the alliance itself. Uh, and so that's a really interesting, I think, strand to be drawn out that I'd, I'd love to hear more about. Uh, sorry for going over a little bit. Thanks. Thank you, Senior Fellow Snyder. And last but not least, yeah, Professor Arrington, please comment on Professor Yor's presentation. You have about 10 minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's been uh, very thought provoking, and I enjoyed uh, reading the presentations by Professor Chong and Professor Yo ahead of time. Um, my comments, I think, are really to both of them, um, although I read more closely Professor Yaw's um, presentation. And I want to divide my comments into three categories. Um, and as a comparativist, I guess my focus will be more on the domestic politics, um, not just in South Korea, but um, I guess compared to Scott's comments, I'd focus more domestically. Um, so my first comments uh, are regarding the cleavages in the South Korean public or among voters. And I think uh, Professor Chung's uh, data show very clearly, as Scott also highlighted, the ideological cleavages among South Koreans um, that really uh, wash out on the question of China in some sense. There's more consensus, if you will, um, in terms of progressive and conservative views towards China. 
What about the generational cleavages and the gender cleavages um, in South Korea, among South Korean voters? And so, for example, I remember in the THAAD economic retaliation period, the people in their 20s were most pro-THAAD, uh, along with the oldest age cohort, um, compared to the more progressive middle age cohorts, not to imply that those people were middle aged, but um, the middle cohorts. And I've also seen data that the 20s and 30s voters in South Korea um, are more anti-China, if you will, than they are anti-Japan. And so I'd, I'd be curious to hear um, both of your perceptions on how um, there's differences across generational um, cohorts in terms of views of the US-China strategic rivalry. I was looking at some a survey done in 2020 by the Pew Research um, Group and they, across all of the countries that they surveyed, the only one where younger people were more anti-China than older people were was South Korea. And Japan is more close, maybe just because often in surveys, Japanese people tend to cluster around the middle. Um, but the, the implications of this sort of for the future of South Korea and um, Korean foreign policy towards China, I think would be interesting to unpack. Um, and we've seen, as Scott just mentioned, the durable impact of that, this like destruction of any sense of trust in China um, as a result of the economic retaliation, both state directed and as Professor um, Y'all mentioned the, the sort of voluntary boycott uh, by Chinese people of South Korean goods had a very lasting impact on Korean perceptions of um, China. And so I wonder whether uh, maybe because of social media exposure um, that's higher among younger cohorts, whether that actually did more damage um, among younger voters perceptions of China. And then in this uh, last by-election in South Korea, we had the emergence of a sort of gender plus age cleavage and the, the rise of young men um, who voted overwhelmingly for the conservatives. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about whether your data show uh, a distinct perception of China among younger men, certainly in um, in the polling that I've seen, they're overwhelmingly concerned about um, the job, their job prospects, the high cost of housing, um, since men are expected to bring uh, a house to a marriage, um, and the unfair perception that feminists are unfair. So, among these angry young men, if you will, um, what's the? Is there a different perception of China and um, U.S.-China rivalry? The second set of comments that I have for these presentations um, really stems from my interest in the other key US ally in Northeast Asia, and that is Japan. And we have recently this um, vice ministerial trilateral meeting between South Korea, um, Japan, and the United States, and the, the collapse of initiatives to have a Suga um, Moon summit meeting around the, the current Olympics that are gonna start, I guess, to, uh, tomorrow for you. Um, partly that summit meeting idea collapsed due to in, um, inappropriate, indecent, horrible comments uh, by a Japanese diplomat. Um, but this is just an, another kind of negative piece of news coming out of the Olympics. Um, however, if you look at the China-Korea relationship that's been so fraught um, since that, the other really fraught relationship is Japan-Korea. And so I wonder if there's um, any sense, uh, Professor Yaw, especially from your research, whether there's a relationship between um, tensions between Japan and South Korea and tensions between um, Korea and China or the, the health of the relationship between Korea and China. And often there's this sort of comment that, well, North Korea exploits um, daylight or differences between uh, South Korea and its allies? Is there a sense that China is uh, exploiting differences between um, Japan and South Korea? And if so, how? Um, and 
you know, you had the economic retaliation related to Thad, you had economic retaliation related to the Supreme Court rulings in South Korea on the forced labor issue and the breakdown of the comfort women. Um, and so there's this pattern of South Korean public being rightfully, possibly angered about this economic retaliation from its neighbors. And um, so I wonder if you could speak more to the to the role of Japan in these relationships and, and whether um, that has any impact on Korea's proximity or sense of closeness with um, China. The other way in which I think Japan raises interesting questions, and maybe this gets to Professor Yaw, your specialization in um, Chinese uh, political economy, is that uh, between Japan and South Korea, at least you have similar political systems, democracies. Um, and so if we're talking about public opinion, you have not only each government relating to its own public opinion, uh, but the public's relating to each other and the government's relating to the other country's public opinion. And um, so, you know, on the one hand, Japan has a free press, if not a very critical press, and has free speech. And Japanese public runs the gamut from uh, very apologetic progressives in, in Japan on to xenophobic right-wingers who are trying to whitewash history. Uh, is the Chinese range of public opinion about South Korea narrower? Um, and is it more easily exploitable by the Chinese government? Uh, because this is a repressive authoritarian government, not a free and open um, democratic society. And so if, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, the relationships between the publics in South Korea and China and um, the, how that relates to the nature of the political system. For South Korean foreign policymakers, it may be more predictable uh, Chinese public reactions. Um, and so that could make it easier. At the same time, you have um, examples, like you mentioned, of the boycott uh, related to THAAD of Korean goods in China or the backlash against uh, Korean cultural products. And um, so the nature of the, Korean, uh, sorry, the Chinese political system and um, the lack of free press and free speech in China would be very interesting to see how you see, think that affects um, Korean public opinion about US-China rivalry. And then my final set of comments are really picking up on where Scott left off, and that's as we head into the presidential election um, next spring, what role do you see uh, China playing in the South Korean presidential election? It seems that voters may care much more about domestic issues, as you alluded to, uh, Professor Chung, in your presentation, and I think there's plenty of domestic concerns in South Korea, including now vaccine availability and the speed of um, dispersal. Um, but some of these domestic issues can also have China uh, dimensions to them that could get exploited. I think as Scott was mentioning, are these, is the China factor going to become in part because three quarters of the uh, South Korean electorate is concerned about China? Is it gonna become a, um, a point of political contestation in the presidential election. So far, the conservatives have tried to tar Moon Jae-in um, as soft on China. This goes back to the early um, COVID era and the decision not to close the borders right away. Um, and more recently, you had the decision to exempt um, people who received Chinese vaccines from the quarantine period coming into South Korea. Um, but you have other dimensions of concerns about China, such, such as Xinjiang and the human rights issue. Um, how does that play out in the South Korean public opinion? Certainly the South Korean government has sort of hesitated to speak out on this issue, possibly as Professor Yaw mentioned, due to um, South Korean firms concerns about the bottom line. Um, but recently you had the Conservative Party leader Lee Jun Sok uh, speaking about Hong Kong's autonomy as well and the Xinjiang issue. So uh, apparently he pro participated in Hong Kong protests and likened them to South Korean demonstrations. Uh, so to what extent do you think the Conservatives are going to try to use um, the China issue to bludgeon um, progressive candidates in the elections. 
Um, you also had this recent example about the Chinese ambassador to South Korea writing an opinion piece in Chungang Yibo, um, condemning conservative candidate Yoon Seok Yu's comments about Thad uh, being justifiable because of uh, China's defensive radar systems and uh, the Moon Jae-in administration criticizing China for trying to interfere in the elections. Um, so instead of a North wind or Pukpong in this case, are we going to have a China wind in this election? Um, and how would you see this going forward as we head into the election? Is it um, likely in your opinion that Korean voters are um, pretty much in agreement on China? And then, so it's not gonna be such a political issue in the elections or um, are the, the parties, especially maybe the conservatives, going to try to use the China issue as a way to get votes? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Arrington. And now back to our presenters. So Professor Chung, uh, will you give us your comment answers to senior fellow Scott Snyder's comments on your presentation? Uh, or if you have something to add, yeah, to your presentation, now's the chance. Yeah, thank you. You have about 10 minutes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Snyder, for your uh, comments. I actually uh, work on this data analysis. I think your uh, comments will be very helpful to uh, explore more about this, uh, actually the conservative risk. I actually uh, surprised to see this conservative and progressive divide uh, when it comes to us RK alliances, as well as uh, how the priority, um, but, I think when it comes to your questions, alliance cohesion, I think I have several kinds of potential determinants uh, that actually we run this data anal survey analysis right after the US ROK summit. So that has the kind of atmosphere that US ROKs are kind of working together and we have very positive relationships. So that might affect uh, more resonated with conservative party as well. But I think the more, uh, potential determinant about uh, explaining the alliance cohesion would be Moon's mis Moon administration's mishandling of uh, North Korea policy, as well as North Korea's reluctance to respond to South Korea's uh, any offer, um, humanitarian assistance or any uh, uh, offer for uh, dialogue. So that kind of deadlock actually uh, all kind of uh, elevate the kind of threat perception of uh, conservative uh, voters who more care about North Korea risk and more fundamental to the US ROK alliances. So I think uh, that might be the potential uh, kind of uh, risk or potential kind of explanation, uh, but uh, I think we need to more look at uh, the data analysis and uh, add up uh, to to add more analysis, uh, but I can, um, and, and your questions and Professor Arlington's question, I would like to share more data, uh, which could explain the uh, conservative and progressive divide and as, as well as generation divide. Uh, let me just share this. Um, uh, actually, this is in Korean, so you might have very difficulty. So this is the kind of uh, country that is a threat to South Korea's security. Uh, this is North Korea, China, Japan, and United States. And this is the kind of generation. So you can see that uh, the younger generations perceive more threat perception from China, but rest of the generations perceive more uh, threat from North Korea. So that actually explains uh, Arlington's, uh, Professor Arlington's questions about generational effect. Uh, so younger generations are more uh, feel threat from China. So if there is a China wins, like a Jungkook uh, Param, <laughs> not Bukpung, but Jungkook Param, that might be the strategy to resonate with younger voters, especially younger male voters who are used to be very reluctant to vote uh, in, in elections like United States younger generations. They are kind of non-voters uh, in the past, but it could be a very good uh, uh, strategy to uh, raise their opinions and raise their kind of attentions about uh, elections next uh, next year. So uh, that's kind of the perception. So it's kind of crossroad uh, between China and uh, uh, China and uh, North Korea uh, by generation. So this could explain. Uh, I will run more data, data analysis, but that could explain uh, your questions, I guess. And about the uh, questionnaire about 
whether alliance is necessary. Actually, I run this uh, questionnaires for every questions. Uh, so there's a cross tab uh, between these questionnaires and other questionnaires. And, and what we have uh, seen uh, from my presentation is just one of them. So this is just a simple questions, whether you, we need US alliances. And there is a kind of, as I said, there's a polarization, but they favor uh, United States as a country, but there is a kind of polarization whether United States, uh, we need alliances with the United States, but yeah, there is a conservative and progressive divide. I actually uh, very uh, surprised to see that result by myself. Um, I will look more, um, uh, run more data analysis like regressions or other statistical model to look at uh, how actually uh, this impact is meaningful in terms of their uh, foreign policy preference later. Thank you, Professor Chung. And now, Professor Yeo, uh, would you give your answers to uh, Professor Arrington's uh, comments on your presentation? Yeah, thank you. You have about 10 minutes. Thank you so, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, I have so many questions, so let me just uh, answer one by one. So <clears throat> first one is, um, as I just, Professor Zhang answered about this generation gap and US-China competition support. I think we have some kind of generation split about this US-China competition. From my personal experience, even it doesn't really matter, elite or non-elite, I think, uh, above 50 or above 50, uh, late 50 and 60 generation, and strongly support US alliance and US, uh, US side. Because I think one of the major impact about why they prefer US uh, side, because they have some experience, Korean war. So above 60 generation, they have some Korean war. And for them, China also communist. I explain China is not communist. It's not like some crazy country and North Korea things. In, but they have some kind of experience. You never know how we suffer during Korean War, and they are communist region. So that also affects some progressive Korean politician have more some supportive some policy towards China and. And people immediately criticize uh, they have some kind of communist regime, something like. So, so bottom line is that we have some kind of generation gap. But so that 20 and 30 generation, we didn't have these kind of some Korean war. And so do not particularly support uh, United States for ideological region, but um, more balanced so, and more interest-based. So we have a lot of some job opportunity. For example, if you if you have some knowledge about China, you speak Chinese, you have a great opportunity in job market. So for for some kind of realistic reason, afraid of China, but it's important. I think that's some young generation perception and approach toward US and China competition, I think. And then so what about the role of Japan? between US-China competition and also Korea's US uh, alliance. I think we have very strong, some negative emotional, I think some kind of some emotional reaction response to Japan. So let me show one, some survey about uh, Japan. It's Korean, but uh, I think it's good to show. The first one is, uh, why you support ending, it's not ending actually, but ending uh, Jisomiya, some Korea, Japan, sharing some military information. And most of people, almost 80% of people, uh, they answer because uh, Japanese government have a very unfair treatment for South Korea because, because Japan was unfair. And, and so the ending Jisomiya is some kind of reciprocity. It's a very fair response. And at the same time, um, and at the same time, we uh, Korea answer, uh, we need to remind Japan of how South Korea is important. And all kinds of things. At the same time, the question is why use why Korean uh, support boycott Japanese product? 
the largest one is because uh, Japanese export control restriction is unfair. So that it's very appropriate reaction. At the same time, the other, now it's changed. Um, during that was Abe administration. So Korean people in general um, disagree about this overall Abe approach diplomacy towards South Korea and their policy. So this is the largest region. So in general, I think Korean have a more negative outlook toward Japan at this moment than China. So this is maybe a major obstacle to coordinate Korea, Japan, US uh, traditional alliance. This is major, I think is going to be barrier. Uh, Korea, Japan, some kind of deep distrust and somehow some hatred at this moment. So. And the, the other one, um, some load of the load of China next spring presidential election. Uh, what is the expectation? So, as you as you know, this uh, I think next presidential election, South Korea, China is not a major concern for Korean border, but uh, we have some different approach between conservative elite and progressive elite. And there are some kind of general consensus, progressive politician and leadership is, it's, it's too soft towards China. And so we have some kind of expectation next presidency election progressive regime will suffer and probably regime will change it. So toward the more conservative uh, party. So in that case, um, maybe more it's, it's, it's closer to US South Korea alliance and Chinese, um, the space China play out will be smaller than now, I guess, next presidency election. Uh, that's my prospect. And another very important point you ask of Hong Kong, Xinjiang. I also have very interest about this topic and a lot of some uh, professor or some elite uh, very unhappy about too much Korean government too silent and remain too silent. But that's relating to this Moon Jae-in government. It's very cautious towards China and most of the leading elite are progressive and don't want to provoke China unnecessarily. So it's so silent. But I think uh, the next president's election, the leadership changes, Probably we have a more different approach towards uh, Japan, uh, the Xinjiang and Hong Kong. And personally, I think we need to um, speak out a little bit more. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yeo. Uh, okay, now we can have uh, an open discussion. So if you have any questions, comments or thoughts, just feel free to share with us or Oh, for instance, now could be the chance for the presenters to ask questions to discussants and so on. Yeah, so, yeah. so, do you have anything, yeah, any question that you want to raise? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Senior Fellow Scott Snyder. Yeah. yeah, I actually have two follow up uh, questions. Uh, you know, one, Professor Chung, it seems to me that the issue of uh, polarization with regard to the US-Korea alliance, it will be important to determine whether uh, it, alliance issues are the direct or indirect cause, uh, because you mentioned that it seems like uh, there's so much polarization over uh, how to approach North Korea. Uh, and at least at present, uh, you know, the Biden and Moon administrations are trying to establish a uh, coordinated policy toward North Korea. Uh, and so it just raises questions for me as to whether the uh, impacts of polarization are direct or indirect. And then uh, for Professor Ya, I'd actually like to hear a little bit more about um, uh, the impact of that on current thinking in the uh, South Korean business community. Uh, especially, uh, you mentioned um, the emphasis uh, that the Biden administration has on supply chain resilience, 
uh, and the potential impact on the semiconductor industry. Uh, and that actually is an interesting case, I think, in part because um, there are uh, U.S. players in that market who actually have greater dependence on the China market uh, than Samsung does. And so in some sense, Samsung's interest in continuing to gain, engage in China is probably going to be protected by some of the advocacy that may go on among other actors. Uh, but, you know, this whole uh, issue of uh, dependency on the China market, you know, overall, the trade relationship seems like it's still pretty robust. Uh, and I'm wondering if the trade relationship is actually lagging public opinion or whether public opinion is going to have an impact on how, uh, on the extent to which South Korean corporates believe that they can continue to engage effectively uh, in um, uh, trade with China or participation in the China market. Yeah, Professor Arrington, do you have something to add? <laughs> yeah, sure. I wanted to follow up on Scott's um, comment about sort of supply chain resilience. And it's, it, certainly in the Japan-Korea um, relationship after econ the perceived economic retaliation by Japan in summer 2019, uh, the business community in South Korea very actively um, tried to establish more autonomy um, to reduce its dependence on uh, Japanese suppliers. And I don't know the extent to which that occurred with that, um, but was, was there a conscious initiative uh, by Korean firms after THAAD to insulate themselves from uh, potential economic retaliation? And the, the, the follow-up then is on the sort of um, issues that have come to the fore in part due to transnational advocacy and multiple governments um, shaming, if you will, China on the Hong Kong issue and the Xinjiang issue. Are South Korean firms who are doing business in China vulnerable to Korean public campaigns, public opinion campaigns, I guess, to uh, expose uh, their complicity? in human rights abuses or the, um, the political crackdown in Hong Kong. Thank you, Professor Arrington. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes left. So I can only give Professor Chung and Professor Yeo about like four or five minutes each. So I know you have a lot to say, but please try to be as concise as possible. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Professor Chung, you go first. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Snyder. I have uh, thought about that uh, question as well, because that's the kind of main issues between the United States and South Korea. And my concern is that as long as there is a ideological divide within South Korea, uh, that will be a kind of chance for North Korea to take advantage of. Uh, and uh, to say that there is a gap between progressive and conservative uh, conservative base about how to approach North Korea, uh, that means different approach to North Korea, but also that means that uh, different approach to China as well. It's not about uh, just North Korea policy, but it's about how to uh, look China and how China will behave vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship with North Korea, uh, whether we uh, get more role to China about uh, improving our relationship uh, between North and South and whether China can help us dialogue with North Korea. That kind of expectations are different between uh, cons uh, conservative and uh, progressive base. So uh, that all polarization is uh, have more repercussions in broader kind of uh, great power politics in the region. So that would be a concern for me, uh, uh, but we'll look at the data uh, more uh, deeper analysis, yeah. Professor Yeo, could you go ahead first? Yeah, we will come back to Professor Chung later, <laughs> yeah. So let me uh, quickly respond to Scott's comment and then wrap it up the presentation. So you ask about the South Korean business community impact on Korean diplomacy and US-China competition. I think we have some impact because this is why 5G, uh, the Huawei ban and South Korea did not um, uh, did not clarify the position so that we just respect uh, business autonomy and their decision. This is why, uh, this is somehow how 
Korean business community impact. And I heard from Samsung, Samsung, some business community that they're very concerned about losing market in China. But at the same time, they also take into account uh, some future opportunity in, in the United States, example, like electric car and battery, all these things. So, so let's look. Um, I think we have a more positive outlook and we calculate more so that there are more opportunity in the US market, but Korean government will more clarify the position. So, and also you asked uh, how the trade dependency affect the public opinion that exactly reflect why Korean prefer balanced approach. And even after start crisis, Korean remain expert reliance on China more than, more than 20% is the highest. So it's, it's consistent. So it's, it's reality and we cannot ignore about this kind of trade relations. So yes, I think it, it, it affects public opinion. And I really appreciate this opportunity to meet this great um, scholar and online and having your, your think about US-China competition. So based on what we saw during uh, the two presentations, and it seems South Koreans are more pro-US than pro-China as of now. Yeah. And it seems South Koreans in general have more favorable attitudes toward the US than China according to the survey results. Yeah. And South Koreans generally think US alliance should be strengthened. Yeah. But at the same time, majority of South Koreans seem to think South Korea should take a balanced stance rather than leaning toward either the US or China. Yeah. It's risky to pick a side while the US-China rivalry and competition is intensifying. So, so having a favorable view toward the US and ROC-US alliance, but supporting balanced approach to the US and China, the, these seemingly, seemingly different, different attitudes uh, coexist among South Koreans. So how do you think this is going to, this is going to affect the future of ROC-US alliance? Yeah? What, what implication does it have on ROC-US alliance? Yeah? Do you think eventually rock US alliance will alliance will weaken or do you think public opinion won't have any effect on the strength of the rock US alliance? Yeah. I'll I'll take a brief shot at that. I mean, I actually think that the the more decisive factor uh, is going to be uh, the relative size and power uh, of the US and China especially in shaping uh, the global environment. Uh, and that public opinion will probably be a lagging indicator um, uh, and will reflect uh, the public's perception of South Korea's uh, interests as it navigates uh, that potential uh, shift uh, in overall ability to shape international rules of the road between the U.S. and China. Okay, so this was the first seminar of the six seminar schedule for the 2021 Rock US Think Tank seminar series. And well, we still don't know exactly how much influence public opinion has on the government's foreign policy decision-making process in Korea, but we do know that, but, that <clears throat> politicians couldn't afford to ignore the, what the public thinks. And, and thanks to our distinguished participants, we were able to have high quality constructive discussions regarding public opinion in South Korea and its implications on rock US alliance. And I, I'd like to thank you all and good evening and good night to senior fellow Scott Snyder and Professor Arrington yeah, and have a good rest of the day for Professor Chung and Yo. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.